I'm Steve Leach, director of the Dartmouth Cancer Center, and I want to welcome on our, our entire Dartmouth Cancer Center community. This evening, we begin our 13th annual Telling Our Story celebration, a celebration to highlight our patients, survivors, and care partners who present their original works through the Creative Arts Program at the Dartmouth Cancer Center. This evening, we also celebrate the Complementary Care Program, a program supporting our cancer community in body, mind, and spirit, now for over 22 years. Through creative arts, support groups, healing arts, wellness classes, and more, our Complementary Care Program's supportive and restorative network continues to be here for you. We are forever grateful to all of our sponsors, Without the generosity of our donors, especially those that support the annual Proudy event, our creative arts and complementary care programs would simply not be possible. Our creative arts program is available not only for patients of our Dartmouth Cancer Center, but also for patients within Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, thanks to a brilliant working partnership with the DH Arts and Humanities Program. We also express gratitude to all who make telling our stories take form. Program specialist Michelle Davis for her compassionate coordination. Creative writer Marjorie Sada for mentoring our creative writers. Visual artist Kim Hall for mentoring all of our artists. And therapeutic harpist Margaret Stevens, Pam Stoyer, and Patty Williams for sharing their beautiful healing music. And of course, to all of you who have stepped forward with stories, poems, and art, and most importantly, a willingness to share your journey. We thank you all. You continue to inspire us. Your work speaks for itself, so let's get to it. The title of this poem comes from Greek mythology. Karkinos is a giant crab who was turned into the constellation Cancer. Later, Hippocrates named masses of cancerous cells Karkinos. Karkinos. I am the kitchen, the smelly armpit of the house. Grimy drawer bottoms, dirt on the walls, dust on the air vent above the stove. Life happens here. I see it all. She enters and announces, I'm crabby again, flinging things out of the refrigerator, slamming them on the counter. He skulks off my camera, mournful sounds of the cello coming from another room. She cleaves the meat, scalps the lemons, hacks carrots and potatoes, skewers the lamb. The box on top of the refrigerator blares music. She stomps the floor with her feet, swivels her hips, and lets her voice rip. 
Her voice is hoarse and raspy. Ready, she tries to shout, but it is more like a whimper. I hear her pounding on a door as if with a mallet, so loud my ears ring. They are back. The music is off. Exhausted now, fury floods from her, sucked up by the air purifier. Its particle light is red. She sits, depleted as gray. They give an intimate embrace with their eyes, wrapped in a shroud of sadness. She slumps in her chair, picks up a knife and fork. The giant crab that lives inside her clicks his pincers. She eats and is eaten. Fast moving clouds crossing the sky this morning, they're leaving me behind. My tempo is out of sync with the rest of the world. My brain's sluggish, my limbs heavy and achy. Air is hard to pull into my lungs, as if I'm breathing crossways to a high wind, working hard to pull oxygen from the fast moving stream. But I feel no wind. Morphine drip. Stealing myself to see, I cracked an eye, just barely. Through the haze of my lashes, open enough to see, but not enough for anyone else to know I was awake or alive. I heard the slurp while wakening, or maybe it woke me? The wet slurping from the corner was a busy, noisy, sucking sound, and I wondered, has some child wandered down the hall and found comfort in the curtained corner of my room, slobbering and crunching over a lollipop in a rush to get to that paper stick before being discovered by a searching parent? Instead, I saw a troll, the kind that lives under a bridge, greedily sucking on a bone. Dog days. A is for April, B is for bravery, C is for cancer, D is for diagnosis. If only I knew the name of his dog, I thought as I walked, but I didn't ask the boy. Instead, hi, says I. He's a chocolate, says the boy, as if he knew I wanted to know. Oh, yes, says I. D is for dog, C is for cancer, B is for good grade, A is for a good day. Hello, my name is Kathleen. I am here tonight to read a piece that was part of one of the writing circles uh, that Marjorie facilitated. Uh, as a writer, I am very honored to be part of the circle and to be able to share early work and have the reaction of other writers. Uh, it's a very positive experience and it really is a, a situation where I think we um, give each other not only support, but a sense of courage in facing some difficult emotions. Um, the piece that I'm going to read is called The Kiss, and this is my memory of being 10 years old, and it's the morning of my mother's funeral, and I'm in my childhood kitchen. The Kiss. The sky knows grief, black fingers that weep in layers of clouds. Clouds gather, turn gray in tendrils near the comfort of earth. Earth tone coat she wore fades into memory. Memory of her yeast breads replaced by bakery boxes, pastry too sweet. Sweet 
orange juice splashed into bourbon. Aunts and uncles whisper in the kitchen. Trails of cigarette smoke float, float through the requiem mass, strangled by incense as my soul is kissed by Ave Maria. I have long been interested in stories, particularly the stories that went untold. In my earlier years, those stories were about the internment and also stories of my father's beloved mother, my grandmother, for whom I was named. Spitting came easily to me. For years, each night, I told my children another installment of our beloved Matt and Percy stories. I read aloud to them for hours the name of them, and I had no fear of setting up in front of an audience and addressing a group. I had no idea I would literally lose my voice. Before the surgery, my daughter asked if I would need speech therapy. The doctor replied, Oh yes, her speech will be normal. Normal? I had absolutely no speech at all. Fortunately, I had been prepared and had packed a portable white bird and erasable marker. It became my new best friend and the only way I could communicate. Thank goodness I had paid attention in this last set and grade lessons on penmanship. I cannot tell you how many nurses, doctors, and technicians explained on my handwriting cells while I was in mute. And I was mute for months. Gradually, I began to speak. I could make sounds, although only my immediate family could translate them, which a speech therapy helped. Unfortunately, I had to put the lessons on hold while I spent months praying to darkness for the daily hyperbaric treatments. Telephone calls became another source of difficulty because who could understand it? Thank goodness my son was on hand to take the calls and speak to doctors' offices, insurance companies, and medical suppliers. It's funny how Amazon can get something to me in a couple of days, but medical suppliers cannot send the correct order to me. No finger. My speech has gotten better. Just the other morning, I spoke to my son 
and noticed that it took no effort. Absolutely no effort on my part. Ten remarks without any prompting from me. Man, you sound so clear today. Just a bit of a lisp. I have not been able to replicate that experience, but it gives me hope. In the meantime, I know that I have found my voice along with my speech. I ask questions. I advocate for myself. Recently, my employer terminated me after ten years of devoted, dedicated service. I did not accept the first severance offer, but negotiated another deal. Because of the cancer, I am writing again. So, in many ways, although I struggle with my speech, I have at last found my voice. Worship, I am open. I am open here under the two red oaks whose branches play with touch, whose branches almost, almost touch with leaves tightly furled in early spring, whose branches reach across the chasm of sky space, forming an arc, framing emptiness, whose branches play with touch as breeze carries them closer, whose fully emerged green fingers touch barely, barely touch, framing the empty expanse of sky. I am here too in the emptiness, reveling in the touch, fingers intertwining, a green bow connecting heaven and earth. Here under the two red oaks, I am open. I spread my arms, thin as an outermost branch. I spread my arms like the oaks, and I give thanks. Every writer finds a new entrance into the mystery, Lucci. 
How do I introduce myself in advance of the unknown? Hello, new classmates. Do I simply invite you to know about the last door I entered, the one decorated with a garland of lilacs in bloom? I was commemorating almost 55 years since I last walked through the great court gates and left my college life behind. Or do I invite you to know that last week I began a third round of chemo? They say I failed the first two. The new one is intended to prevent further growth of invasive tumors tangled in my bladder, and more weeds to pull before they take over the garden. I invite you to know that I plan to live through to my next college reunion. And once that milestone has, has passed, I'd like to thrive pulling weeds until the next season and the next and the next until in due time, my turn to step into the unknown arrives. I'll begin by reading a note that I wrote to the reader. Friendship brings the gift of finding ourselves through the love of others at all stages of our life. Discovering friendship. We hold hands fiercely, confident we are best friends as we squint at the camera, high top shoes painted white, clean cotton ankle socks, dresses starched and ironed. We share a time before our families had television, Studebakers, two-story homes made possible by the GI Bill. We play in the side yard of the tenement, line up rocks to mark our kitchen, pretend to cook and serve each other meals. You and I are strong together, unafraid. Play hide and seek between the line dried sheets, confident that we have each other, unaware that we are post-war babies. Dads trying to sleep through nightmares, moms who married young, far from their moms, new to keeping house, longing for their former lives. Swells. Motion sick in my stationary body. I know this feeling in its whole entirety blazing through me. If only I had a way to keep it at bay. I know this feeling always just around the corner if I make a wrong turn or take a wrong turn. Today at the store, I reached into the coolness for the butter and I found myself hanging on to the door, closing my eyes and willing it away. Please don't let there be anyone else in the aisle. I don't want to have to explain. There are towels, a blooming, a foreboding heaviness, sometimes a smell that I can almost taste a pinching above my nose or a dampness in between my fingers. I know this feeling even quietly sitting, holding on to my stationary body while poised for the swell, car sick on my own couch. Those four fruit trees. In the season called the past four years, is it like the presidential cycle, like cicadas sometimes, or do I like, 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 like? I am stumbling wild in the fruit grove. Four directions, the winds, one thumbless mitten. I brought Ned stumbling wild in the fruit grove. Ned, 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 look at this tree and all these trees, these trees are dying. Look at the leaves, a disease. And all of these things are, I think, he said gently and kindly, these are fall, Karen. And I didn't, haven't yet stopped my manic laughter. And still, all of those past four fruit trees are mine. You wee trees, we are home and stumbling wild in the fruit grove. A mother's job. 
A mother's job is to take care of her kids, no matter how she's feeling herself. She puts their needs in front of her own and puts her, her own needs up on the top shelf. A mother's job is to always be happy, to show a cheerful, smiling face. She makes sure everyone else feels good. For her own worries, there is no time or space. My mother just turned 90 years old. She spent two weeks in the hospital gravely ill. Now she's in hospice care at a nursing home and taking a back seat to others still. While her old body is tired and worn and she can barely hold up her head, she's telling my dad and me to have a good day, always thinking of others instead. So the least I can do is to make her comfortable, to help her eat and comb her white hair, I can hold her frail hand and kiss her sweet cheek, say, I love you, mom, and say a favorite prayer. I can tell her how much I appreciate her and all the care she's shown for everyone. I can tell her that she did her job very well, and now her job is done. Dear mom, you mean so much to me. I love you with all my heart. I want you to be happy and at peace, even if we have to part. Thank you for being the best mom on earth, for putting family first in everything you do. You will always be in my heart and soul. Dear mom, sweet mom, I love you. Linus prowls hospital halls in moon dust slippers. She springs from the solar calendar to recount her longest day. Stars foretell her story in constellations, strewn across the Milky Way and upon infusion whiteboards. If a diagnosis was once your longest day, the lioness may instruct, at solstice, light candles, then speak this. Life is a streaking meteor. The truth of your fire flashes by. Snowy meadows, black at midnight, are the same which held your morning gaze. The lioness might yawn. Pain is a puddle of wax. Her infusion chair spins in icy orbit. Lioness looks about, then speaks. Such a lot of ivy tubing and drug bags dripping. Paw and needle in solidarity, that's all. Wrapped in a furry solstice night, breathing chilled air, Lioness will speak this. I am star and planet, an orb in a gorgeous cosmos. Lioness lights candles and roars. I am infant and elder. I am mother and cub. I am candle and wick. The first stanza of this poem quotes Linda Pastan's poem, What We Want. Who is the dream? We don't remember the dream. The dream remembers us. It is there all day, as the stars are there, even in the full sun. What or who remembers us, knows our names, carries them faithfully, even when we forget? Who or what knows our names, carries them forward, beckoning here, I get you, I am you. A mirror waiting for us to join with our reflections, walk into our true selves. The dream remembers us, even when we are not looking and cannot hear. The dream remembers our names and holds them for us until we are ready, ready to come home. Do I know you? Really know you? I know the hollow place under your shoulder where my head can rest. The arc of your arm as you throw a ball for Tilly to fetch. The goofy references to TV ads from the 50s and 60s, relics from your childhood. I remember when we rubbed each other raw, each one rasping and sanding the other to make from the materials at hand the partner we thought we needed. Then cancer brought the power tools, 
chainsaws, bandsaws, drills. Surprisingly, instead of leaving us flayed and bleeding, the heartwood in each of us was revealed. I do know you, really know you. You want words. You want sentences, paragraphs, chapters, books, poetry, and more. More less. You want to convey the beauty of this world in words that you might first write across the page, then perhaps tap on the keyboard illuminated onto a screen. You will, of course, depict the pain of living, of dying, but you will write as beauty, as the beauty of children laughing in their sleep, as parents' souls departing as they die, and their faces becoming softer and lovelier, as the first Wildflower to appear after a long, hard winter, and the taste of a sweet, tart raspberry just plucked, the gentle look of a lover's face, and the sound as shooting stars and moonlight on the ocean. You will write as miracles and more. Mm -hmm.